open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans is in the New Testament, which is the second half of your Bibles. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Romans chapter 8. As you turn to Romans chapter 8, I'm going to have to, just at the very start here, beg for your grace and mercy this morning for two reasons. Uh, one of them is a physical reason. So I've been fighting uh, laryngitis since Wednesday, and I'm really hoping my, th- my voice holds out through all of this. On top of that, we had a, a 12-hour powerlifting meet yesterday across the street at Salmon High School, and um, I have a raging headache after being in a gym with teenage boys all day uh, that carried into this morning, so my head feels like it's about to split open right now. So one's a physical reason, I'm, my voice and my head is killing me. Uh, The other one is a spiritual reason. We should always approach the Bible with humility. We should especially approach the Bible with humility when we deal with texts that have a grandeur to their nature that is often beyond our comprehension. This morning, we're going to deal with one of those texts. And if you're unaware of church history, this has been one of those texts that have been debated about throughout the centuries. Not just the decades, but the centuries. Because of that, oftentimes what can happen is when people read what we're going to read this morning, it can become a point of contention, of controversy, of argument, and even division between two Christians who normally should love each other in the name of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, what happens is we, because of our argument and our contention over this text, we often miss the exact point that the text is trying to make. And you say, well, if this text has been such a point of argument and contention and debate throughout history, then why are you preaching it? We have to understand as part of my commitment that we preach all of God's Word because we believe that it's all useful and that if God has given it to us, He has given it to us for a reason and a purpose, and you and I need it, that He's given it to us. We need this text. So what my hope is, is this morning, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm probably not going to answer every single question that you have about this. If I did, I'd have to be, I'd have to bring in hundreds of years of debate and you and I would be here for hours and hours upon end. But what I can do is make the main point of the text, the main point of my sermon. And that's my goal this morning is to make the main point of this text the main point of my sermon, so that we walk away not in controversy, not in division, not upset, but we walk away with the hope that only God's Word can give us. So I beg for your grace this morning. Will you help me to that endeavor? All right. Those of you that won't, I'm sorry in advance, (laughs) but thank you for everyone else. So Romans chapter 8. You have to follow the argument that's been made here in Romans chapter 8 to understand what's going on. So we're given these great promises of salvation. Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Paul teases that out and works that out. What does it mean that we have no condemnation? But then it gets to that rather sticky phrase in verse 17, provided that we suffer with Christ, that we will also be glorified with him. So I mean, you, you read the first 16 verses, and it's incredible. We're no condemnation to Christ. We're going we're gonna to have these amazing gifts of salvation, provided we suffer. But then it goes into what we looked at last week, that we're not going to suffer alone, that even creation itself is groaning. And as creation is groaning, it's awaiting glory that is to come, as we all are waiting to be glorified in Christ Jesus. In the meantime... We have the Holy Spirit who is with us, who is working within us to give us a great amount of comfort. He's going to move from that idea of the Holy Spirit working inside of us while we're waiting to be glorified to knowing the certainty and the surety that we will be glorified because God is for us. But in between those two thoughts, the Holy Spirit working inside of us uh, until we're glorified and the, the certainty that we will be glorified is this question. How do you and I know for sure that God is for us and not against us? How do we know that God will glorify us? How do we know that we're not going to be left or forsaken or abandoned? Today's text seeks to answer that question with this 
the main point of this text is this, that God has a, a definite plan and purpose with respect to salvation to make us like Christ. And God has a definite plan and purpose with respect to salvation to make us like Christ. We re- read with me in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, we all love verse 28. There's not a whole lot of controversy with that verse. That a God accomplishes his purposes through all things, including our suffering. It is an amazing promise to understand that God works all things together for our good. Now, there's a few things we need to understand about this. Who is this? And is it, does, sometimes we use this phrase of, we'll say things like, there's a reason for everything. Um, uh, all things will turn out good in the end. It's sort of this positivity, positive, positive, optimistic view on life that everything's just going to turn out okay for everyone. But that's not who this promise is to. This promise has a limit upon it in verse 28. Those who love God. It's not a promise for all. It's a promise for those who love God. Matter of fact, it's the opposite of Romans 1, 24. In Romans chapter 1, you have people who have rejected God, who have ignored God, and God has given them over to the desires of their heart. There, in Romans chapter 1, even good things are bad for those who don't love God. And people that, that have what we would consider health and wealth and all sorts of things that don't teach them to rely upon the Lord. So even the good things in their life draw them away from the Lord. Romans 1 is the opposite of what you see here in Romans 8. In Romans 8, he says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, why love? I mean, we could easily ask, why doesn't he say we know for those who believe God, all things work together for good. Why does he use love here in this place? Well, there's a few things here. One is the Bible makes the statement that even the demons believe God exists and shudder. And so belief is not always a measurement of a relationship with the Lord, though we are called to believe and trust and re- repent, in, uh, repent of our sins and trust in God and who God is. I think the reason why he uses love here is because the Bible makes this point that we're going to walk through many trials and suffering in this life. Matter of fact, Jesus tells the parable of the sower and the seed and talks about how some seed landed on ground and it was choked up by the weeds and the troubles of this life. When you walk through trials and suffering, love is what endures. I think this is why he uses those who love God. It's a way of designating that this only applies to Christians. Christians, not just people who believe in God. I have friends who believe God exists, but they're not Christians. But to love God is to know Him, is to be in relationship with Him. And therefore, this only applies to Christians who have a relationship with God and love God and know God on a personal level. So only to Christians, what is being promised? That all things work together for good. Now the good has to be defined here. The good is not health and wealth. And I, I, I want to point this out in particular because there are people today who say, well, God works all things out together for good for those who love him. That must mean that I'm going to have the best bank account. I'm always going to be healthy. Everything's going to be great in my life. It is also, it's not that everything is going to be healthy. It's not everything's going to be wealthy. It's not an attitude that, you know, everything's going to work out in the end. Everything, you know, it's just don't worry about it. Everything's going to work out in the end. This is not what Paul is saying. What he's saying here comes to us in verse 29 and 30, that God is working to our our good, and his good is to conform us to the image of his son. This is the greatest, highest good in our life, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so the promise is that no matter what happens in your life, God is always working to make us more like Jesus. He's, making, he's always working in life to make us more loving, gracious, noble, good, Christ-like. Everything in our life we can trust that God is working to make us more like Jesus. Now, that's not always what we would consider good things. Sometimes that means we walk through trials and suffering and tragedy and difficulty, and yet we can trust that even through those things, God is working in our life to make us like Jesus. 
I mean, think about how many of us in here would say, have you ever been through a difficult time in life? Yes, nod your head, yeah. One way nod, I'm asleep, right? You ever been through a difficult time in your life? Would you look back at the difficult time in your life and say, you know what, I never want to do that again. I never want to go through that again. But I can see how God was using that in my life to make me who I am today. I can, I can see how God was shaping and molding my life through that thing that I walked through in this life. This is the idea of what we're, we're talking about. When God says he works all things to the good of those who love him, he means all things. All means all. And so we understand this, uh, that this removes. When God works all things to our good... For those who love him, those who are in Christ, we understand that, that that removes our reasons for fear and worry and doubt and anxiety. I mean, think about how many times in our life we looked and said, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to take place. And we begin to panic about the things in our life. We can trust as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, that if we're in Christ, then there really is no such thing as accidents or chance or luck. God allows these things in a ha- to happen in our life because God is sovereign. God knows all things, God has all power, and God allows and is able to work all things in our life to the good of conforming us like Jesus. I'll never forget, this is one of the things that we struggled with when both of my in-laws were diagnosed with cancer at the same time. And still to this day, I love their testimony. My mother-in-law has since passed away, but their testimony was this that we don't know why God is allowing us to walk through this, but we know that he's doing it for his good. And we're going to trust him as we walk through this difficulty and tragedy. When we say that God works all things to our good, to be conforming to the image of his son Jesus, we really mean all things, even the bad things in our life. Now I want to give you a, a caveat here. We're not saying that bad is good. We're, we're not sadistic. We're not like going, oh, this terrible thing happened in my life. Yay! We're, we're not sadistic. Bad is still bad. Evil is still evil. Hatred is still hatred. Suffering is still, uh, still suffering. But what we are saying is that even bad things, God can use them for the good in our life to make us like Jesus. In other words, God is so good. God is so powerful. God is so great he can even use the terrible things in our life for his good and glorious purposes. I'll give you a few examples of this. One is uh, the story of Joseph. You remember the story of Joseph? His brothers got really jealous of him. They threw him down in a well. They sold him into slavery. He ends up in prison. He goes through this terrible thing that you know, we talk about in moments, but that took years of his life. Finally, he ends up in a position where he's able to reconfront his brothers. He reconfronts them in Genesis chapter 50. And his brothers are terrified because now Joseph is in a place of power. And his brothers realize that, you know, hey, we did all these heinous things towards him. Joseph makes this statement in Genesis chapter 50. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. He said, look, God can even take this bad thing in my life and use it for good. I mean, think about the story of Job. I mean, we preach through Job here in the church. I mean, you look at Job, Job, the book of Job makes this point over and over again about Job. There is nothing in Job that is, that is wicked. There's nothing in Job that is, that is unrighteous. Matter of fact, God himself is the one that points out in Job chapter 1, hey, have you considered my servant Job? He's upright and walks in all of my ways. And yet God allows him to walk through all of these tragedies and difficulties in life. He doesn't cause it, but he permits it. He allows it. And Job comes through that, walking through, seeing how great and magnificent the Lord is. It's a statement. When we say that God works all things to the good of those who love him, what we're saying is that there's nothing that can overrule God's purposes in this life. There's no sickness. There's no death. There's no grief. There's no sin. There's no trial. There's no tribulation. There is nothing that can overrule God's purposes in our life. I don't know about you, but to me, that's an amazing comfort when I think about how uncertain life often seems, how uncertain it seems. You think about how many people you, you and I know that everything was going great, and then they go to the doctor's office, and they get a diagnosis that appears to come out of nowhere. It's uncertain. Or think back into 2019. Can you remember that far back into 2019? 2019. World was going along, but it was going along. And then all of a sudden, none of us knew what 2020 was going to bring. It's just this crazy, wild year that got dropped into our laps. Think about how many people have been driving down the street. And a drunk driver meets them along the way. 
They have no idea that that's going to happen to them that day. Life is full of uncertainty for you and I, but it is not uncertain to God. So when we say we know that God works all things to the good of those who love him, what we're saying is we know that there's nothing in this world, there's nothing in this life that can overrule the sovereignty of God. There's nothing that can overrule the goodness of God. There's nothing that can overrule what God is doing. Now notice the certainty that he says, he says, verse 28, we know, we know this. He doesn't say we feel this. I'll be honest with you, feelings are great when they're good. But our feelings can often be deceptive. And sometimes we just don't feel close to God. Sometimes we just don't feel like God is there for us. And so a lot of times what we have to do is we have to accept things by faith. It feels like God is far off, but we know based on his word that God is close to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So a lot of times our feelings can be deceptive. So we have to go by faith in what we know. Not all things are going to feel good. We're not always going to feel like God is close to us. But what we know by faith is that God's good purpose is to work in our life to conform us to the image of Christ. For those called, this is what he said, for those called according to his purpose, at the end of verse 28. So we trust in God to accomplish his purpose. Do you follow me so, so far? This is the uncontroversial part of the sermon, by the way. <laughs> We're about to get to the controversial part. So we trust that God is good in all these things. He accomplishes his purposes through all things, including suffering, including difficult things in life, that God is sovereign and working. Well, how do we trust that? How do we know that God is working all things to our good? Well, this is where he moves into verse 29. That God acts from his foreknowledge to our glory. Now, that's key, that whole process. God acts from his foreknowledge to our glory. And the key to this text in verse 29 and 30 it is, is, is that it is God who does all things. Now, this is where I want to take a little bit of a caveat, and I, and I hope you stay with me through this difficult part. We are used to hearing theology from a man-centered perspective because a lot of our theology, a lot of our evangelism is exactly that. What does God call us to? So I'm just going to tell you beforehand, before we dive into this, I believe with all my heart that God calls us to believe in Him. We have to believe in Him. We have to trust in Him. I believe that God calls us to repent of our sins. We have to repent of our sins and trust in it. So oftentimes when we share the gospel, this is what we're talking about. You need to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. I will also say this. If you're an unbeliever that's here today, maybe you're an atheist or an agnostic, maybe you're watching online, we're really glad that you're here. I hope you come back. I'm going to be honest with you, though. These promises in verse 29 and 30 really don't apply to unbelievers. This is a doctrine that's given for believers. It's meant to give us a tremendous amount of hope and comfort and peace. And so this, this aspect, verse 29 and 30, we don't want to flip the script. We don't want to go towards a man-centered theology because we'll miss the entire point of why these two verses are in, in, this, in the Bible. This is a God-centered theology. This is, what, this is salvation from God's perspective. What does God do? What has God done? Not necessarily what he calls us to do, though we're going to talk about that, but what has God done from his throne in heaven? What has God done? Well, notice what it says. This is how, verse 28, we know that God works all things to the good of those who love him. Verse 29, for those, key, for, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So this word foreknew is actually the controversial word. Sometimes people would think the predestined part is the controversial part, but it's really not. The controversial part comes over the argument of foreknew. Now, there's two ways you could look at this. One way is you could say that God is omniscient and he knows the future. And we certainly would agree with that. You and I are not open theists. In other words, we don't believe that the future is a surprise to God. We believe that God knows all things. That includes what's going to happen tomorrow. That includes what's going to happen a month from now, a year from now. We believe that God knows all things. And so one way to look at this would be say that God knows what's going to happen in the future. And so because of his foreknowledge, he does these things. I just don't think that's the point or the, the emphasis of this verse in particular. The point of the emphasis in this, this verse in particular is more than that. It's that for God to know, there's a connection to his love upon us. In other words, it's personal. His foreknowledge is personal in this verse. And it means the same thing as when we read in the Old Testament where it talks about so-and-so knew their wife. And it's talking about something that is intimate and personal to them. 
Jesus will say this about it in Matthew 7, verse 23. Depart from me, for I never knew you. He's saying, look, I never had this personal, intimate relationship with you. Matter of fact, the word for foreknowledge is used six times in the New Testament. Four times it's used relational to, be, to mean to be loved and to care for. And so I think the force of the text is not so much our love for God or what we've done in response to God. The force of this verse is God's love for us. And that's why we're going to get into these wonderful promises next week, uh, beginning in verse 31, about how we can never be separated from the love of God. Well, how can we never be separated from the love of God? Because God has planned and purposed and initiated His love. And apart from His love, none of us would know who He is. It's a way of saying that salvation belongs to the Lord. Another place that you can go to is you could think about in 1 John or other passages that talk about none of us loved God, but God loved us. Christ died for us while we were still his enemies. In other words, God in and of himself is a loving God and has extended his love to us. This is the idea behind foreknowledge. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. To be predestined is to have planned a glorious destination. In other words, God's glorious destination for those of us who are in Christ is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. There will never be a person who is in Jesus who will not be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I know there's a lot of objections that come from this. When we start thinking about from a sovereign God side of salvation, what God has done, some of the objections are things like this. Well, does that make God a tyrant or arbitrary in this way? When we look at you know, a certain person is saved and another person doesn't know Jesus. I'll be honest with you, this is one of the things that I wrestle with. I have uh, family members who are atheists that I love dearly and I pray for their salvation every day. So we wrestle with this reality. What in, that, what in the world is going on here? But what I would argue is that that is the wrong focus of this text. You see, the focus of this text is we understand through Romans that justice condemns us. And yet the point that Paul is making here is that you and I don't get what we deserve, that God has been merciful in his dealings towards us. And because God has been merciful, he has extended love towards us. One of the ways you can think about this is people wrestle with, does this destroy freedom? Remember I told you we're used to thinking from a man-centered perspective of repenting and trusting in Jesus, which we must do. But here is a God-centered perspective. The Westminster Confession of Faith uh, 3.1 says this, that God does no violence to human will. One of the great examples that we see of this, this mystery being held together between divine sovereignty and human responsibility is in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, he says that Jesus Christ was crucified by God's purpose and foreknowledge. So he says, look, Acts 2.23, 2, God had his purpose and his foreknowledge. This is why Jesus was crucified. He came purposely to die for our sins. God planned it out, and that's why he came. But then in the very next verse, in the very next breath, he turns around and says, but you killed him. You're the one that killed him. So we look at that and say, well, how can God purpose, and how can God know and have foreknowledge for him to die, and how can they be responsible for killing him and crucifying him? What we would say is that the Lord, knowing, foreordains all events, yet he respects secondary causes. In other words, he respects the hearts of men, reason, choices, these type of things. Another way that you can think of it is like this. Suppose you had a woman who comes to Christ. She's lived life, she's walked through, and she's had a particularly difficult time in life. And all of a sudden, she just happens to come across a Bible. And so she buys the Bible or picks up the Bible and begins to read the Bible. And then one day, she decides, I'm going to go to church. She goes to church and she hears the gospel and she's convicted in her heart. And so she repents of her sin, she trusts in Jesus, and she becomes a Christian. She looks back upon that in her life, and she would look and say, you know what? I could see how God was working to bring the Bible in my life. I could see how God was working to bring these people in my life. I could see how God was working to bring me to church. I could see how the Holy Spirit was working to convict me of my sin, to bring me to this moment that I am right now. And what she would say is, all of that is of God working in my life to bring salvation to me. Someone argues, should this stop evangelism? I would say, far from it, this should encourage it. 
we should offer the gospel freely and openly to all. And the reason why I say this, that this encourages it, is because we know that God is working. Let me just tell you, I get nervous every Sunday. I'm especially nervous today. One of the reasons I get nervous every Sunday is I wrestle with these thoughts. Let you into the preacher brain for just a moment. What if I fail? I mean, what if I just totally blow it? I mean, like for some of you, this is, for some of you, you're a visitor, you've come here today. For some of you, you're, you're long-term church members. I mean, we, we've had church members who, they've tried to get their neighbor to come to church for 20 years, and they show up for one Sunday. That's a lot of pressure. So what if I totally fail? What, what, what if I don't say the right words? What if I don't do the right thing? What if, maybe I'll keep somebody from, from getting into heaven one day. But here's the reality. There will not be a single person in heaven because of anything I've done. There will only be in a per, people in heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done and God working to bring people to Jesus Christ. And so what gives me comfort is knowing that when I preach, I want to do my best. But I may be a total failure, and God still works. And so far from drawing us away from evangelism, it draws us to evangelism, knowing that God is working out His purposes in salvation. It's one of the reasons we have great hope in taking the gospel to the nations while we go to Mexico and other places. Because I don't know about you, but I firmly believe there's coming a day where someone, at least one person, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, will be worshiping Jesus at his feet. That means there's at least one person in every tribe, tongue, and nation who will come to Christ, who will know Jesus. And this is what gave me great hope. We started going to Madagascar 15 years ago, and no one knew Jesus. There's no believers, and it would sound crazy to go preach them the gospel. But I knew that someone from the Mahafali tribe was going to be worshiping Jesus at his feet. That's what gives us great hope of evangelism. So far from drawing us to evangelism, it should call us to offer the gospel freely and openly, trusting that God is working out His purposes in salvation. This is a sense where we follow this chain along, where it says that not only He, he foreknew, He predestined, in order that might be firstborn among the brothers, and those whom He predestined, He also called. In one sense, there is an open, external, universal call to all persons to repent and trust in Jesus. This is why you see in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, phrases like this. Anyone who is weary and heavy laden should come to me and find rest. Or John 7, 30, uh, 7 37, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and find uh, living water to drink. Or this is why you find the passages that speak about whosoever. But when we speak about in this verse, in this sense of being called, we're talking about an effectual call. We're saying that God's word does not go out void. And there's the power of the gospel to bring people to Christ to make them born again. And so this is no reason for us to be passive. This is no reason for us to be despair. But we believe that God is working. And because of that, we respond and repent and believe. So this is not for a reason for despair. This is a reason for us to have great hope that we see from a God perspective that God is working in salvation to, to bring about his purposes through Jesus Christ. Now, not only do we, uh, we trust that those whom are called, but those whom are called, he also justifies. To be justified is to be declared legally right. That God, you notice the progression that's taking here. That God has initiated, God has worked, God has act, acted, and in doing so, He's going to see these things through completion to justify us and to declare us legally right, which brings us to our ultimate hope. Verse 30. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. And this is where I, I really hope and I prayed all week long that in the midst of what could be controversial, we did not miss the point. And I think because we, we don't ever get here. We, we get hung up at the beginning of verse 29 
We don't ever get to the end of verse 30, and we miss the point of the text altogether. The point of the text is, how do we know that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him? How do we know that God will see us through to glorification? Paul says we know because we see that God has divinely been working for his purposes to bring about salvation. And if God has divinely been working, he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. And completion is not just forgiveness, though forgiveness is part of it. For, completion is not just uh, beginning to shape us in the image of Christ, though that's part of it. Completion is is glorification in Christ. This is the end of our salvation. It's not, just, it's not just forgiveness. Forgiveness, yes, is a part of it, but the end of it is glorification. In other words, when you and I are glorified, all sin in us will finally be eradicated. Let me say that again. When you and I are glorified in Christ, all sin in us will be eradicated. I don't know about you, but I wrestle with sin. I strive against sin, and I, and I get tired of fighting against sin. And sometimes I wonder if this fight and the struggle will ever end. But yes, it will end, and I know it will end because I will be glorified in Jesus Christ because God is working to see me be glorified in Jesus Christ. And when all sin is eradicated in me in my glorification through Jesus Christ, I will be made perfect in body. I can't wait for that day. I believe, now this is Casey, this is not the Bible. I believe chocolate chip cookies are going to be fat free in heaven. (laughs) Because our bodies are going to be perfect. I also believe I'm going to be seven foot tall, so take that with a grain of salt. (laughs) But I know that I'm going to be made perfect in body with a resurrected body that is perfect like Jesus Christ has had a resurrection But not only am I going to be perfect in body, I'm going to be perfect in soul. And my soul that has been stained by sin, my soul that has wrestled with sin, my soul that has struggled with sin, it's going to be once and for all cleansed of this thing I've wrestled with my whole life. And the whole point of the text is that it was God who sought me. And it was God who bought me. And it was God who loved me. And somebody said, well, if God is the one who sought you, and God is the one who bought you, and God is the one who loved you, then what was your part in your salvation? You want to know what my part in my salvation was? My part was running away until God caught me. But God saved me through Jesus Christ. So the context of this is that God works all things together for the good for those who are in Christ Jesus and God is working to accomplish his purpose and we can trust it because of this understanding this is what's going to lead us into next week the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints that we understand that God will finish the work God's going to bring us through to to glorification God's not going to leave us as we are God's going to finish what he's done in us even though we walk through suffering even though we're not perfect now even though we wrestle with sin now God is going to bring this through to completion So God has a definite plan and purpose with respect to salvation to make us like Christ. So as a believer in Jesus, I'm supposed to rest and hope in that plan. I'm not, I'm not supposed to, it's not supposed to be about an endless debate. The debate's fun. It's not about trying to, to bring uncertainty in my life or, or, or a lack of confidence in my life. What I ought to be able is I ought to be able to look at these verses and go, yeah, God is working in my life through Jesus Christ. I know Jesus. I trust in Jesus. And I can see how God, who began that work, will see it through to completion. And God will bring me to glorification. The whole point of this text is that you and I have a great and grand God working to our good through Jesus Christ. Now that's fun to read in church. But that's really hard to live out when you're in the hospital room and you don't know what's about to happen. That's where faith comes in and say, I have no clue what the doctor's about to say next. But I know I have a good God who works all things to my good and he will bring me to glorification in Christ. It's real easy to read in church. It's really hard when you struggle with depression and anxiety in the darkness of the night. You feel like you've been abandoned and are forsaken and no one cares about you. But that's where faith comes in and says, no, I know my God has not left me or forsaken me or abandoned me because he who began a good work in me will see it through to completion. 
This is where, for us as believers in Jesus Christ, this is where the rubber meets the road. Do we really believe that God is for us in Jesus Christ, that God has begun a good work in us, and that same God will see it through to the very end? That's where this understanding comes to the, to the rubber meets the road, so to speak. It's where it comes to live in our lives. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but I know that this God works all things together for my good to make me like Jesus. If you're an unbeliever, this promise is really not for you. This promise is for those who are in Jesus. But what I would extend to you is the same point that I've been trying to make throughout this entire sermon. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And the Bible does call you to respond to that message. It calls you to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. If you're in Jesus, all of these promises are gloriously true for you. So my hope for you this morning is that God has been working in your heart and in your life to call you to repent of your sins and trust in Him so that you can have the same great hope that I have that is only found through God's work in Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together this morning. We know that these particular verses have long been debated. But Lord, I pray that today in this church, at this service, on this day, we'd lay down our philosophical knives, so to speak. And we trust in the simple promises of your word knowing that you began a good work in us, knowing that you work all things together for our good because you are a good and sovereign God. Because of that, we have the great hope of glorification only found in Jesus. May that be the promise. May that be the hope. May that be the confidence that we walk with, walk away with today. And Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, I want to invite you to respond to the message you just heard. Maybe you need us to pray with you. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you know how to know Jesus. We'd love to know that too. Maybe you're wrestling with whether or not things are all being worked towards your good. We'd love to pray with you about that as well. Would you sing with us? Uh.